Okay, Ed Lodo, let's listen in now to the countdown. Zero. Ignition. And lift off. Go Falcon. Go GPS. is pitching downrange. Stage one, chamber pressures are nominal. For those of you on radio, what we're just watching right now is the launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 booster launching a next generation GPS satellite for the U.S. Space Force. This is a military satellite. This is not civilian. It's a, it's a new range of GPS satellites to be used by the military. And we're seeing now the, the scene right now from the rocket itself looking back at Cape Canaveral from which it is just a, a launch. And we'll be following this for the next several minutes as that booster is supposed to land again. It is a reusable booster. It's been used for civilian launches before, never for a military one, as I understand it. I want to bring in now uh, Keith Cowing, if I could. As I say, he is an authority on this. He has worked for NASA in the past. Keith, give us your perspective on the significance of this launch. Well, as mentioned before, this is the first time that the, uh, the Defense Department has had enough faith in anybody to reuse a rocket. So that that is significant. But if you step back a bit, and I, I have been watching this stuff for a while, uh, the, watching SpaceX launch and recover rockets is kind of like watching Metro trains arrive here in Washington. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, there it goes. Oh, is that a new one? Uh, they didn't clean it. I mean, it's this is, and I'm, I'm being flippant to make a point here. This has become quite routine, and uh, quite frankly, covering these things is almost boring. I hate to say that, but it's almost boring. But that's NASA's goal, isn't it, as a practical matter, Keith? Well, NASA, not just NASA, but the government as a whole, but then the industry itself is adapting to the fact that now you can reuse rockets. And the old adage was, you know, do you get in a jet, fly across the country and throw away the plane? No. It took a while for that orthodoxy to st crumble in front of uh, space transportation. But now everybody wants reusable rockets, which is a good thing. So, Ed, to come back to you, Ed Ludlow, our colleague who covers space for us, give us a sense of this GPS system. As I understand it, they're, they're basically this is part of an entirely new system for the military. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We're about 30 seconds away, by the way, from first and second stage separation, where the booster will start its descent back to Earth. There's a constellation of around 30 satellites that went into orbit between 1989 and 2006. They're an older generation. This is the fifth of the newer generation, manufactured and designed by Lockheed Martin. And this actually, this specific satellite that's being carried on the rocket today is a significant milestone because what it does is it puts into effect a, a, what's called M-code uh, GPS. Just to interrupt this you, we just a, saw the separation just now, for those of you who are watching on TV and there. on radio, we're just and seeing so, the separation right now. A second stage booster should ignite any second now, which you'll see on your screen. The, the, this specific GPS signal is very significant for the U.S. military because it's highly resistant to jamming. And this satellite being put into orbit today brings full functionality and operational capability to that function. It means basically that U.S. military personnel in hostile environments can receive signals that are sort of less... Uh, susceptible to interference from hostiles who are trying to jam it locally on the ground. So from a military perspective, if SpaceX is successful in deploying this satellite, it's a significant milestone. So Keith Cowan, let's come back to you a moment, because this is very different for me. I'm from a generation where we had Mercury and, Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. Only the government could do this. Tell us about the, the private-public partnership that this represents. Well, it's interesting because you, you, you know, if you, I used to work at NASA, and I think you and I were both watching this as little kids, uh, the Mercury program. Um, a lot of what SpaceX is doing isn't really new. If you look at the sci-fi films we watched as kids, the rockets landed, you know, and did these things. And a lot of the technology that SpaceX is using, and Elon Musk will say this, is dependent upon basic trailblazing that was done by NASA. So it's the old ad is something old, something new, something tried, something true. But the trick here is that they found the right mix. And now everybody's on that fresh that point, and they're also trying to do it. But now there's different types of reusability. So, you know, Elon, once again, caused another paradigm shift, and everybody's jumping on board. Yeah, we continue to watch on TV for our radio audiences, and we're actually watching the spacecraft now up there, uh, approaching or orbit now. Uh, at the same time, Ed, I want to come back to you. Next is what we see, the that booster landing back down again on Earth. Yeah, so that booster has started its descent back down to Earth. It essentially free falls 
using different panels and aerodynamics to slow itself partially. And then at the six minute mark, which is in about 90 seconds time, it will start its first stage burn. And over the course of 90 seconds, slow itself down using those Merlin rockets before landing autonomously on the drone ship in the ocean. It's a fully autonomous process that is calculated right down to the individual second. Yeah, I, I must say, just being of a certain age, I can't believe the quality of the video, live video coming from this right now. I mean, I remember uh, when we first landed on the moon watching that on a black and white TV set. And this is just extraordinary, the, the resolution we're seeing here. Uh, let me ask you, Ed, because this is Bloomberg. How does SpaceX make money? Does it make money? Yeah, this is a great question. I loved Keith's. Uh, description as well of this being so routine because it is routine. This is the 124th, I believe, Falcon 9 launch. There have been 19 this year, and the vast majority of those have been for Starlink, SpaceX's internet based. Uh, a space-based internet system where you pay a $500 fee for a receiver to use on Earth and then a $99 a month subscription, essentially, to receive reliable internet, even in the most remote parts of North America or any other country. And Elon Musk has talked about how the launch side of the business, in other words, what we're watching today, uh, it, topping out at around $3 billion a year in terms of sale. There is a limit to how much money SpaceX can uh, make sending payloads for third parties, other private companies or NASA or the military. But Starlink, he has said, could top out at $30 billion a year. And of course, once that constellation of satellites for Starlink is complete, it's a much higher margin business for SpaceX because simply all they're doing is beaming data to and from Earth. Yeah, Keith Cowan, to go back to you, uh, when, we, when we talk about investments anywhere, uh, much risk brings much reward. And certainly there's a lot of risk involved in this. But I talked to somebody recently from Silicon Valley who invests in space and said, look, at the vacuum of space it pay, builds a nice motor on your business. If you can get those satellites up there, it sounds like the place should make the money off the satellites, not so much the launch. Is that right? Yeah, if you're, it, well, it depends. If you're in the launch business, you want to be making that money. If you're in the satellite business, that's where the money is. Elon sort of uh, got a foot in both camps here, and since he has sort of a, a pun intended, a vertical market, somewhat like Apple, he can control the entire, you know, system from building the satellites to launching them to operating them. And of course, with the new Starship that he's building, instead of launching 20 or 30 of these at a time, he could be launching hundreds. So. Yeah. Put that in your equation. Right. So I want to go back to Ed Ludlow here because I think we're seeing a split screen. One is the aircraft, the, the, the spacecraft up there. And the other, I believe, is the booster returning back down to Earth. It's about to come through the clouds. Is that correct, Ed? Let's imagine. Imagine for the audience listening at home, a downward facing camera. You can see the tail of the booster, which has just done a burn to slow itself down. It's literally falling down through Earth's atmosphere. And over the course of the next 45 seconds, we'll conduct a series of maneuvers which use different panels to use the Earth's air resistance to continue to slow it down. When we're about just a few seconds above the drone ship, which is out in the Atlantic, they'll get another burn from those Mer Merlin engines, which We'll be able to, to see in about 30 seconds time, and all being well, it should land autonomously on that drone platform. So just let's listen in. There's the firing right now as this uh, Falcon 9 booster returns back to land on the drone ship. We're watching it for TV, but you can hear the countdown here. Landing burn. And Seco 1. There's the first stage coming in. Wow, what a beautiful image. Landing legs are deployed. I'm in a parking orbit. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, I, I'm probably older than you are, but we're a certain age. I remember some of those old, old movies with Buck Rogers. That landing reminded me of one of those rockets landing on some faraway planet. With <laughs> it actually, it, sound, it looked like Buck Rogers to me. Really excited. Keith? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm on the space beat, and the first thing I'm thinking of is uh, the joke I'm going to make about him. They missed the X in the logo by, like, 10 feet. It is true. They were about 10 feet off. <laughs> it's amazingly accurate. And, of course, if you're watching as this came down, you saw those grid fins that were discussed. Those were steering the rocket. If you watched the Shenzhou 12 launch yesterday, you would have seen them on the side of the spacecraft. And if you had watched the Soyuz launch, you would have seen them as well. This is a technology that started with the Soviets and then jumped over to SpaceX, and by the way, the Chinese use it. So again, you know, rocket technology is iterative. Uh, you throw away some stuff, you bring back some old stuff, and the trick is getting the right mix for the right, you know, mission right now, and that is clearly what SpaceX has done. 
Uh, so as we continue to watch the spacecraft up there, we now have the booster back down on Earth. Uh, let me conclude here. Keith, let me ask you, what is the next big thing? You say this has become routine, so you're almost getting bored with it. What's the next big disruptive thing? I think the next big disruptive thing would be if Musk can scale things up further with Starship and at the same time, if you have Rocket Lab and Relativity, which is literally 3, 3D printing their entire rocket. Musk is using you know, steel workers to build giant rockets out of stainless steel, and yet people are also trying to 3D print rockets. There's more than one approach here, and again, it's just sort of, you know, do you really need 20 or 30 of these companies doing this, or will you be satisfied with the market with four or five? Those shakeouts are sort of happening in, in different ways simultaneously, and I don't think the picture is quite clear yet, but the fact that more people are jumping in and hundreds of millions of dollars are being poured into this means the smart guys with the money somewhere are thinking there's a future in all of this. So, Ed, let me come back to you on that very question, the so-called space race. It used to be the Soviet Union versus the United States. Now it's a bunch of private companies competing with each other. Is SpaceX just out in front of uh, Blue Origin and, and uh, uh, Virgin Galactic and things like that? Are they really that far in front, or is it just really good marketing? It, they're out in front on all measures, not just in the frequency and launch, but the cost of launch. You know, NASA has published studies that from a human payload perspective, in terms of sending humans to and from International Space Station, it's around $50 million per seat on SpaceX. Compare that with Boeing, Boeing charges about $90 million per seat. On this specific launch that we're looking at today, they actually managed to save uh, space for $64 million versus the original contract by reusing the rocket. Mm -hmm. So they've got the economics down to a T. And at the same time, because they're launching so frequently and servicing International Space Station, you see Boeing as a good example being left on the sidelines because they're not even able to do their test runs to the International Space Station while SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsules mm -hmm. are docked with it. It's a really interesting dynamic right now. Fascinating. I really appreciate both of you for joining us. That's Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, who covers Space Force, and Kevin Cowling. He's a former employee of NASA.